This case history is going to demonstrate how we use video, 3D gait and in-shoe pressure analysis in helping to come to a diagnosis. Before I start, I need to declare that I am a director of Run3D, which is a company that provides 3D gait analysis equipment for clinic. This is a 27-year-old female who in 2007 had plantar heel pain. She received orthosis at the time, had two steroid injections, and it took two years to settle. She subsequently had a, a stress fracture of the fourth metatarsal in 2011, which took six months of rest and rehab. Since that time, she has had various right-sided problems, including the calf, a hamstring with neural symptoms, and the ITB. She's a good level runner, training at five to seven and a half mile pace, a 248 PB for the marathon, and 117 for the half marathon. She currently runs 65 miles per week, over six days, and has had a gradual build up to this distance, so no sudden tissue loading. She does other sports such as weights at the gym and swimming. In a recent paper by Jarvis and the group from Salford, they analyzed the classic assessment criteria that are used for the root model of foot function, looking at forefoot to rear foot position, first NTPJ dorsiflexion, ankle dorsiflexion, and neutral relaxed stance position. Their research showed that none of these were predictive for the kinematic function dynamically. They go on to state that they believe that taken into context with other work, uh, their research uh, should signal the end of the clinical educational and research use of the root and all description of foot function and the use of sub joint neutral position. I feel the structural assessment still has value, particularly as uh, it can provide an idea regarding the underlying range and direction of motion. Uh, importantly for me, uh, we can look at the degree of underlying structural symmetry. If there's an asymmetry, this may well have an effect on function, but also if we've got symmetrical uh, underlying structure but asymmetrical function, then something else may be influencing uh, the function of the foot. It also gives us an idea about the indication of how force may be applied to the foot and therefore what structures uh, may be under stress. Returning to this case, she had an external hip position um, and our evaluation with PDAR tends to show that patients with an external hip position load the lateral border of the foot until they start to get heel lift and the influence of the hip is lost. There was adequate rear foot and first MTPJ motion, so no restrictions. The forefoot was mildly inverted on the rear foot and symmetrical. And weight bearing both heels were relatively perpendicular to the supporting surface. She had a foot posture index of four, which was within the normal uh, published range. And there was no evidence of a structural or functional leg length discrepancy. But she did have a functional limitation of ankle dorsiflexion uh, with associated perineal muscle weakness. Uh, this improved with mobilization of the ankle and the superior tibial fibula joint. So let's have a look at her video. We can see quite clearly that um, the shoe appears to be everting a lot. On the left side, she has a heel strike. And on the right side, you'll note a forefoot strike. If we look at the hip, we're getting a lot of left-sided drop when she's on the right leg and to a lesser extent on the left leg. For the 3D analysis, uh, we use a cluster system uh, whereby uh, these on the pelvis, thigh, shank and shoe are referenced to markers on the pelvis, hip, knee and ankle. This allows us to use three Vicon cameras to record three-dimensional gait. We use the PDAR in-shoe pressure system, which has insoles with four sensors that are able to record at 100 hertz and therefore we can look at the loading within the shoe. When we look at the type of report we get from the 3D analysis, um, what we can see here is the blue triangle is the left side, the red circle is the right side. These values are then compared statistically to an uninjured database, and the values are then plotted plus or minus one standard deviation for the ideal range and excessive and restricted. This allows us to evaluate motion at the pelvis, hip, knee, and ankle. So let's look at her particular values. And what's notable at the pelvis is the asymmetry, and in particular, the excessive right-sided pelvic rotation at foot strike. When we look at the hip, because there's high pelvic rotation, we've got low hip rotation, but you'll note that there is excessive hip adduction on the right side. 
And if anything on the left, it's restricted. When we look at the step, we, uh, when we looked at the video, it, there was an appearance that she may have a crossover type gait. But the system records the width at the first foot strike. And if you look at the uh, top view on the left, we can see we've got a heel strike. And on the right, the forefoot strike. And at this point, there is a normal width. However, I've overlaid a grid below that shows the position of the right foot once uh, there is full loading uh, of the foot. And this gives the appearance that there's a crossover gait when in fact there isn't. And this foot position is due to what's happening at the hip and the pelvis. If we look in the sagittal plane, we can see that there's excessive knee flexion and ankle dorsiflexion. And as a result, there's reduced vertical excursion as a lot of the motion is happening around the knee and the ankle. If we look at the foot and ankle, we can see for the left-sided heel strike that we've got increased dorsiflexion, and for the forefoot strike, it's within the normal range, but less than the left side. What is of note is that there's an overstride bilaterally, despite having a relatively high cadence. When we look at the rear foot, and please note that we are taking measures from the shoe, and it's not the foot within the shoe, that there is a degree of inversion at foot strike, uh, more so on the right, that the actual position that is achieved is within the normal range, but we have a relatively high excursion on the right side, even though the velocity is within the normal range, but again, slightly higher on the right side. Of particular note is the restriction of tibial rotation. Uh, and we quite often see this, and, and we can't measure uh, rotation in any other way. And if we note that it's restricted on the right, this could be related to the limited dorsiflexion that we saw uh, on the clinical assessment. O although I suspect that the limitation was more a result of the function than the function a result of the limitation. So what's the summary of our findings? We have excessive right pelvic rotation and hip adduction. We have excessive knee flexion and ankle dorsiflexion. There's an excessive step length, an asymmetrical foot strike, and normal rear foot eversion parameters on the shoe. Now let's look at the in-shoe analysis. And if you look on the right side, you will note that there is no heel contact. We have heel contact on the left. We have a forefoot strike on the right. But despite the shoe looking as though there is rear foot contact, there is no rear foot contact. This is a completely asymmetrical gait and loading pattern. So why is there a right forefoot strike? Well, when we observed this, I asked her some more questions, and it became apparent that 10 years previously, when she had the heel pain, she had adapted her gait to reduce load uh, beneath the right heel. So she was completely unaware that this persisted. In this paper published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, they reviewed running retraining, and with regards to forefoot strike, noted that there would be reduced ankle dorsiflexion, which we saw, a short step length, which was not the case, we had a long step length, and an increased cadence. Again, she had a relatively high cadence. In a recently published paper, they evaluated pelvic rotation and its effect on stride length. And they noted that females tend to use pelvic rotation to maintain and increase step length. So what was the process in this instance? Generally, a forefoot strike should have a short step length. However, she naturally has a long step length but maintains the forefoot strike. The only way that she can do this is to have excessive pelvic rotation, which results in reduced hip rotation, but excessive hip adduction, and the combination gives the appearance that she has a narrow step width. We can also look at strength and flexibility and map this uh, against the uh, database, and we can clearly see that there is quadriceps and hamstring inflexibility which would need to be addressed. When we look at strength, it's notable that there's a reduction in hip extension. And although hip adduction and external rotation are within the normal range for the level she wishes to perform at, it would be preferable for her to improve the strength. And this can help with the excessive hip adduction. Of note is the ankle inversion and eversion strength. And this is something I'm always keen on uh, with many of my patients to optimize from a strength perspective. Nig and his group have recently postulated that rather than everything being a top-down, that there may be a bottom-up approach and that strengthening of the small muscles around the ankle has the potential 
for injury prevention. Uh, clearly, further research is uh, required, but it does help to highlight the importance of ankle strength. There is evidence in the literature that strengthening programs help with symptoms, but do not actually change function. And therefore, it's been proposed that gait retraining may be a better option uh, in the long term to try and alter uh, abnormal kinematics. So what are our management options? We can consider foot strike modification, so encourage a right heel strike, shorten the step length. And we're also going to want to consider uh, optimizing control of hip adduction and potentially increasing hip extension. But there are some important considerations. Although she has niggles, uh, she is performing without significant injury. If we encourage a heel strike, can we flare up the heel pain that she had 10 years previously? And altering function has the potential to cause other injuries. Uh, as we don't remove load, we just change where load's applied when we alter gait and patterns. She's currently performing to a high level. And if we alter her function, it is going to reduce her performance in the short term, but potentially it could reduce function or alter function in the long term. So it's important we have a discussion with the athlete about her desires. We talk about the potential risks of any management plan and her level of commitment to whatever we wish to implement. So that gives us the option for real-time gait retraining. And you'll see here how we can choose which area we look at and look at the various parameters. And this helps us to uh, not only change function, but to see where we may place load when we change that function. Uh, in this example, uh, we're simply changing the uh, cadence, the step rate, to look at how that affects whichever aspect of the lower limb we wish to choose. And clearly we can do that whether we're looking at hip adduction, hip extension, uh, step length, etc. So in conclusion, video analysis is useful but has limitations, particularly as it cannot measure rotation. Footwear prescription is rife with problems. In this review of the literature, it became clear that there is absolutely no evidence base to support the commonly used methods for prescribing running shoes. In our particular instance, some may have considered a stability shoe given the position of the shoe on the video. But our evaluation has clearly shown that this position is a combination of what's happening around the hip and the pelvis, but also the unique loading pattern within that shoe. It's a four-foot strike with no heel contact. Therefore, a stability shoe would have had minimal benefit. Advanced technology can help us with our diagnosis and management planning. But that management should be patient-focused and, wherever possible, evidence-based. So hopefully uh, you found this interesting, and clearly the interpretations are my interpretation. Um, here are the references, which I'll post separately. And I hope um, this stimulates some discussion. Thanks for listening.